Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, IoT and Implications for Organizational Structure. Our speaker today is Jim Heppelman, President and Chief Executive Officer with PTC. My name is Steve Paul, Contributing Editor at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. Our thanks go out to Teradata for their sponsorship of this webinar. This event will be recorded and will be available to all attendees approximately three to four business days after the event of our live event. In addition, today's slides will also be available to attendees. This webinar contains audience polling question. Please complete the poll when it appears, and we thank you in advance for your participation. We welcome your questions for our speaker today, and to submit a question, please enter them at any time in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Or you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMREEvent. We'll answer as many questions as time permits after our presentation. If you're having any audio difficulties while listening via computer, please call in via telephone instead. And now let's begin our presentation, IoT and Implications for Organizational Structure. Let's go over to you, Jim. Great. Uh, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Teradata, as well. So um, I'm uh, pleased to have this opportunity to uh, talk you know, about this topic that I'm very passionate about uh, here today, and it's really a topic about physical digital convergence. First, uh, what does that mean for the products that we create and use and service and sell and market? And then uh, what are the implications for those changes on the typical organizational structures we've uh, had for a long time. And, and you'll see there actually are some uh, pretty significant challenges worth talking about. So uh, just to be clear, much of this uh, uh, information I'm going to share with you this morning is based on several uh, articles that I've written with uh, Harvard Business School Professor Michael Porter. Uh, we've written two articles that have been published in uh, HBR, and we're working on a third one. Um, and I'll share some content from these articles, but in particular, the second article uh, looked at how does the Internet of Things affect what happens inside a company. So the first article looked a little bit more at the outside, how does a company compete in the uh, marketplace, but the second ar article said how does this change the nature of work that's done in a company, and then how does that change the organization. And again, uh, we'll see that there are some... Uh, significant implications to the organization. So let me jump into it, and uh, I want to start with a simple example that I'll refer to uh, even in the organizational implications, and that is a smart tennis racket from uh, Bob Alot. So uh, I have one of these tennis rackets, and if you uh, look at it or hold it in your hand, uh, it looks pretty much like any other tennis racket. It feels pretty much like any other tennis racket, but it's not. It's a smart connected tennis racket, and in fact, in the handle, there are a number of... Uh, sensors. There is a three-axis accelerometer that's measuring real-time forces in X, Y, and Z directions. And there's an electronic gyroscope that's measuring, uh, you know, attitude, pitch, and roll of the uh, tennis racket, much as you'd measure those things in an airplane. And then this data, of course, is being uh, communicated up to the cloud and processed and, and delivered back to the user uh, in a uh, cell phone app, a mobile app. You might notice if you look at the base of the handle, you see a couple little white marks, and in fact, what that is is the uh, place you can plug in your little uh, cable to recharge the battery that's in the handle. And uh, inside the handle is a Bluetooth connector that connects to your cell phone, and then from your cell phone, we, uh, you know, we get to the Internet through uh, normal IP protocols. So if we look at the DNA of that tennis racket, um, it's very interesting, and, and this is really going to be part of the reason there's a lot of organizational pressures that I'll come to later. But basically, what I'm holding in my hand at the bottom is actually a physical product, and that product uh, used to be made entirely of hardware, you know, uh, the the frame, the strings, etc. But now it has uh, electronics and quite a bit of software, you know, digital content actually running on a computer, more or less, in the handle. And that computer, as I mentioned, is using various forms of networking communication to get up to the cloud. And in effect, the second half of the tennis racket is running in the cloud. And in the cloud, we have uh, some technology. We, know we have a database because we want to collect data from many different tennis rackets and, and compare one to the next and so forth. We're going to use analytics because somehow we have to, we have to find what are the correlation between uh, the physics forces measured in an accelerometer 
and uh, measured in electronic gyroscope, how, how do those physics forces uh, relate to good swings, bad swings, you know, to winning games, to uh, to players who don't win the game. We have to figure that out, and we can't figure it out simply by looking at the values uh, that are streaming to us. Then we probably want an application platform because we're going to want to develop many different kinds of applications. We might want an application for the player to uh, help them understand the strengths and weaknesses of their game. We might want an application for the coach to help uh, compare the players in, you know, under their tutelage. We might want one for the club. Uh, we might want one for the league. Uh, we certainly probably want one for the sales and marketing department who sold that tennis racket, um, who might want to monitor how it's being used. And maybe the engineers also want to know how it's being used so that they could improve the design or make complementary products or next generation tennis rackets and so forth. So lots of interesting things uh, can happen, you know, based on the data we get from the tennis racket. Now, one of the things we've observed, and this is really the focus of the third paper I'm working on with Professor Porter, is that somehow we kind of missed the uh, digital experience, uh, or, or we missed the human experience, let me say. Because uh, that tennis racket, you can either interact in the way you traditionally did while holding it in your hand, or you can, uh, you can look at the mobile app on your cell phone. But these are two very different experiences. And uh, even though the tennis racket is half digital and half physical at the same time, the experience of interacting with it is either digital or physical, and it's very different. So an example from an automobile is this uh, Volvo XC90, which is a smart connected automobile like uh, many others are today. And you can either interact with this car on your cell phone, or you can put the cell phone in your pocket or purse and climb in the car and interact with it with the way you used to. So this isn't really a converged experience uh, for the human. It's two different experiences for a product that has converged. And we think uh, there's something interesting that I want to introduce you there that's happening uh, with augmented and virtual reality. So I want to play a demonstration for you here um, that comes from an event uh, that PTC did a couple months ago. And uh, what we're looking at here is the shell. That's me, by the way. But this is the physical shell of a Ford F-150 pickup truck from a few years back. And normally, uh, if you go back enough years, you'd find physical gauges where that piece of cardboard is with the uh, Thing Event logo. And uh, then in subsequent generation, you'd have computer screens. But I'm now going to show you that the next generation is that the computer screen is effectively worn on your head as smart glasses. But because it's hard to show what's happening there, uh, I'm going to use an iPad instead. So you notice when I point at the iPad, I actually see gauges where there are none. Uh, there, these gauges are telling me everything I need to know about the uh, experience of the automobile, but they don't actually exist uh, on the automobile. There are no physical parts behind this. And because these gauges are digital, um, I can press one of these uh, buttons down at the bottom, and uh, I can change the look and feel of the, uh, of the uh, experience. I can go from... Uh, you know, uh, uh, a traditional experience all the way to a very contemporary and uh, different looking experience. And it's easy to do that because, again, there's no physical reality to what I'm seeing here. I'm, I'm seeing that uh, through an augmentation of physical reality. So let me uh, come back and try to uh, show you um, what's, what's going on behind that. Uh, so, basically, I was using two technologies at once that I think fit magically together. On one hand, uh, Internet of Things helps us get data from the truck or from the tennis racket and perform analytics on that data and create interesting observations and so forth. And then augmented reality allows us to take that data, that digital data, and map it back on to the physical thing that I'm interacting with and to create really a truly... Uh, converge physical digital experience. I, as a human, can both see and hear at the same time. Uh, and, and we humans love that because we get different information at different processing rates from, uh, let's say, sound or data and, and vision. And, of course, we use these two different data sources to kind of confirm the quality of each other. Uh, you might have heard the term body language. You know, body language refers to... Uh, when somebody's body motion, what you see, 
doesn't really confirm what you're hearing. There seems to be a disconnect. So I want to show you now a version of this uh, so-called technology stack that uh, Professor Porter and I are elaborating on and show you how that looks if that person at the top uh, is using an AR or augmented reality experience. Because now they're looking at information, you know, a, a capture, a video capture of the physical world that has been augmented with uh, digital information. And one of the main and best sources of digital information is what we're learning through the data channel um, of that smart connected product, that, that thing on the Internet of Things. So we're getting sensor readings, we're getting analytics, but we're also reaching through to business systems and, and to other systems because we can pull in data from business systems, from external systems, and from connected products and put it all together and uh, show it as an augmentation of the physical reality or just pipe the video to somebody remotely and give them a virtual reality experience that combines uh, both digital and physical. So that's a cool idea, and I want to show you one more video uh, to show you how that might look when mapped onto a physical product. And uh, the example I want to show you here is the so-called blue pump. And uh, what we're looking at here in this example is um, first of just a plain video capture on my iPhone. Uh, I'm looking at a pump. This is a 3D printed piece of plastic, but let's pretend it's a real pump with sensors on it. And so this is just regular video. Now I'm switching to an application that uses augmented reality. So now when I look at that pump, you can see I'm augmenting digital parts onto the uh, physical product. It's a very interesting concept here because what I see is an assembly that's part real, part physical, and part digital. And I can, for example, hit that button on the left and pull design data right out of the design files and map that onto the environment. Or I can hit the I button on the right, which means bring in business information, and I might pull information from a CRM system or a, a PLM system, something like that, and be able to bring that into the field of view. Or I could hit that third button over with the squiggly lines, which means show me sensor and analytics data. And now what I'm seeing is, uh, for example, that ugly red triangle, which uh, suggests there's some kind of a problem that our analytics are finding. But I also see a gauge that's telling me the RPM, the 1190, uh, you know, the, the 1198, 1206 changing number there is a real-time gauge mapped onto this physical product. And then the last thing I might want to do is say, okay, if there's a problem, show me how to take it apart. And so by hitting that little triangle scenario, I can disassemble and then uh, graphically reassemble this product, uh, you know, for the end user who's, who needs to interact with it, maybe a, a service technician or uh, or what have you. So that's a fun little demonstration to kind of show the uh, notion of, you know, physical digital convergence that also involves the human experience. Okay. At that point, uh, I want to turn it over to Steve and uh, ask Steve, if you would please, to uh, administer our poll question, and then uh, we'll come back and move on to the to the organizational implications of such technology. Okay, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, yeah, we do have a quick uh, interactive poll that we'd like to uh, ask for our audience here, and we want to just um, ask you quite simply: uh, Does your company currently have an initiative related to uh, either uh, IoT or uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, or maybe both? or maybe neither. So uh, please uh, provide uh, some feedback for us. We're uh, going to tabulate this information and, uh, and share it with you uh, shortly. Uh, Jim, while we're waiting, uh, maybe could you could give me a little bit of insight. Uh, where is the industry overall in this transformation? Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're much farther ahead right now with uh, IoT, and I think the poll results are already starting to show that. Uh, than we are with uh, AR and VR, but that's coming like a freight train. So let me first say, um, sometimes I like to use a baseball analogy, and uh, I'm here in Boston, uh, as is MIT, and frequently I take uh, customers and sometimes international customers to Red Sox games. And it's very interesting to think of a baseball game because, you know, there's a few rules you need to know and then a whole bunch of exceptions like the infield fly rule and so forth that are very hard to explain. So I like to say we're in the third inning, meaning you've watched a little bit of it, uh, you're starting to understand uh, how this industry works, but there are still surprises, and you certainly don't know how it's going to end. So that's how I like to think of IoT as being uh, in the third inning. I think I would put AR, VR as several steps behind that, 
but coming like a freight train because you may be aware of the big investments that Microsoft is making, you know, spending billions of dollars on the HoloLens. Uh, you've probably heard, heard of uh, Google and Magic Leap. So Magic Leap is a startup company that's raised uh, $1.4 billion of uh, venture capital to do uh, AR and VR, you know, Facebook, uh, Oculus. You know, there's a number of things happening out there with big, big backers um, to try to bring this cool idea from the world of gaming really into the world of business. So um, I'm glad to see there are 12 companies already out there uh, investigating um, AR and VR, uh, but it's not surprising to me that actually the majority of companies, the, the large uh, majority of companies, uh, actually I see 35 are doing both. So uh, um, the large majority of companies are you know, doing uh, IoT and quite a few actually are beginning to play around with AR and VR. So that's... Uh, that's very great. Thank you, uh, Steve, for, for doing that, Paul. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me move on now to the main topic, which is how does this affect, um, you know, the nature, of, uh, the nature of organization and business inside, a, uh, inside an enterprise. Some of you might remember there's this uh, somewhat famous uh, playful quote from Jeff Immelt from GE, and uh, he said at one point, uh, if you went to bed last night as an industrial company, you're going to wake up as a software and analytics company. And uh, that's a cute quote, and, uh, and it really gets you thinking, but I'd say that what I've actually witnessed in practice is it's a lot harder than that. You don't just wake up as a software and digital company. And the reason you don't is because you need to become, if you're a manufacturer like GE, a software and digital company while remaining an uh, industrial company. And it turns out that industrial companies and software and digital companies are very, very different animals. They're just, uh, you know, very, if you work for the world's best industrial company and you work for the world's best software company, you'd characterize those experiences as vastly different uh, from the perspective of an employee. So this is a cute idea, but in practice it's much more challenging. So let me share a few of the bigger challenges. Uh, first of all, location. If you were to take uh, a map of the world and map all of the industrial hotspots, you know, uh, uh, places like the uh, Rust Belt of the Midwest, you know, the automotive industry in Detroit and, uh, and the automotive industry in places like Japan and so forth, if you mapped all the industrial hotspots and then you mapped the uh, digital hotspots, you know, Silicon Valley, uh, places like Boston, the Research Triangle, uh, you know, plenty of other places, you'd actually find there isn't that much overlap that mostly the digital hotspots are in different places than are the industrial hotspots. And so one of the big challenges right now is location. A second thing you'd find is that um, digital companies are spread all over the world because they have no physical assets that need to be moved around. A pure digital company doesn't. And so you actually don't need to concentrate your employees all in the same place. Now, uh, a second thing you'd find is that the talent is very, very different. And uh, quite frankly, this digital talent uh, is a foreign uh, thing to industrial companies, and it turns out it's uh, very much in demand. Uh, you know, we've all heard, for example, how, how, how hard it is to get data scientists, but also uh, digital user experience experts that could make the kind of dashboards or uh, experiences that, that I was showing you in those demonstrations. Uh, it's hard to find people, and it turns out you have a lot of competition because the digital companies, the peer digital companies, are also trying to build up talent around analytics and user experience and so forth, you know, cloud scale and, and security, um, you know, all of these challenges. Uh, the software industry is clamoring for talent, and now the industrial industry is also clamoring for that same talent. There's not a lot of it, and a lot of that talent would rather work in a pure, uh, pure digital environment than a, than a sort of what they might see a stodgy manufacturing company who's trying to just become a little bit digital. Um, a couple more things, you know, culture and age. Uh, I can't tell you how different a software company culture is from uh, industrial company culture, and I know that because I work for a software company, and, and I'm part of that industry, but I serve industrial companies, so I spend all kinds of time with them. And, uh, you know, if you walk into a typical Silicon Valley or, or Boston-based uh, digital company, software company, you're going to find it staffed with many, many uh, Generation Xers. They're going to work very strange hours. Some of them are going to come in late and work all night. Uh, they're going to have 
crazy expectations, like uh, they want you to give them free breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, maybe a ping pong table, and perhaps even some beer on tap. I mean, these are not unusual things in high-tech uh, software companies. They're very unusual things in uh, in manufacturing environments. In fact, uh, some of them would be viewed as safety hazards and, and lots of other problems. So culture and age is a big disconnect, as is clock speed. Now, it turns out that um, if you make a product that's part, uh, let's say, mechanical, part electronic, part software, you know, the mechanical changes are implemented over periods of months. The electronic changes might be implemented in periods of weeks, but changes to software and digital content can happen in, uh, in days, even hours. We can build a new version of that product uh, by tweaking a few things here and there, incorporating a new algorithm, rebuilding it, and there we have the new digital content. So as a consequence of that, the processes have evolved in very different directions. You know, most uh, traditional manufacturing enterprises build products against a set of requirements. Typically, they come from marketing or, or maybe from the customer. Um, you work for a long time on a product that meets those requirements, and then you show it to the customer. That's the so-called waterfall method. Uh, whereas digital companies, including the one I work for, have adopted uh, agile practices where you work in one-week sprints. So you work on something for a week, you put it together, you show it to the customer, and you say, is this what you meant? And they say, well, not exactly. I was thinking a little bit different than that. So you say, okay, I'll meet you next week again after we've implemented the next round of changes. So it's a highly iterative, uh, prototype-based process that involves either the real customer or somebody's whose job it is to represent the real customer. This is a huge disconnect because when you put uh, traditional industrial companies and digital companies together, they almost don't speak the same languages. Their processes don't align. Their clock speeds don't align. It's, uh, it's a big, complicated challenge. A couple other things uh, would include uh, investment profile. Uh, you know, a typical industrial company might spend 5% of its revenue on, uh, let's say, engineering. Uh, meanwhile, a, a software or digital company might spend 15, 20, 25, 30, you know, if it's a startup company, more than 100% of its revenue on engineering. But anyway, in any case, the level of spending on things like engineering is much higher. Now, the flip side is there's very little capital involved in, uh, in digital. You know, yeah, you buy some computers, but they're not really that expensive and uh, you don't have any uh, assets out in a factory because there is no factory. Uh, so the amount of investment in the manufacturing on the digital side is uh, nothing. I can build and give you a version of software in the next 10 minutes, and I don't need to even have a factory to do that. Um, much of the spending on the digital side is OPEX. It's really people, uh, whereas on the physical side, there's tremendous amount of CapEx and investment in capital equipment and so forth. And then the sixth thing I'd like to point out is... Uh, his business model is very different. Um, you know, there's a lot of industrial companies who have, uh, over time, complemented their product with service. But the software industry has just jumped right over that idea and embraced this idea of uh, product as a service. Uh, you know, software, for the most part now, is moving rapidly toward a model where you don't buy the software anymore. Uh, you just pay for the right to use it in a certain quantity over a certain period of time, and then periodically you renew that right uh, when your subscription expires and so forth. Um, so we see more and more industrial companies playing with this model. Uh, you know, it started with uh, power by the hour for jet engines and so forth, where you, you don't have to buy the engine, you just have to pay to use it. But, um, you know, there's all kinds of creative examples. I was with a customer yesterday from uh, Train, the uh, air conditioning company, you know, heating, ventilating, air conditioning company. And he was talking about, you know, the model where you're selling building comfort versus, uh, you know, compressors, chillers, boilers, all the hardware it takes to make a building comfortable. So customer used to have to buy all that capital equipment and then pay to have it, you know, maintained and kept running and so forth. Now they say, hey, train, you keep all that. And I'll just sign a contract where you supply and operate and, and maintain whatever equipment is necessary to keep this building, you know, in a temperature range between maybe 69 and 71 year-round. So it's a very different uh, business model, but, you know, we're seeing more and more uh, industrial companies begin to explore these business models because there's some real disruption uh, potential for companies who implement them.
Okay. So in our uh, second paper, Professor Porter and I uh, boiled it down to four big changes that we see uh, companies needing to make to a classical organization structure. So if you look at the gray boxes here, this would be the, cla you know, and ignore the blue markups. The gray boxes would represent a classical organization structure that industrial companies have had for decades. You know, there's a CEO, and then underneath that CEO, there's, uh, you know, R&D and manufacturing and marketing and sales and service and then IT, finance, human resources, and so forth. Um, and, it, and this organizational model is predicated on the idea that we will uh, specialize on common tasks within a department and then use general management to... Uh, to achieve integration between departments, thinking that integration between departments is a little less important than what's happening uh, within the department. Okay, so when we think now about uh, physical digital convergence, there's four problems that just jump right out at us. Uh, the first one is the disconnect between IT and R&D. If I'm building a tennis racket and part of it's physical and part of it runs in the cloud, well, it's certainly the R&D's job to uh, create the physical part. It always has been. In fact, they've always owned creating the entire tennis racket. But now part of that tennis racket involves communications and, and, and databases and analytics and uh, application platforms and web and mobile. And quite frankly, most engineering departments don't have any talent or experience in that world. It's a very different world. Now, down the hallway, the IT guys have that department or have that experience. But they've always been a supporting function, you know, uh, kind of the water boy as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to the football team. But now we need to put them in the starting lineup and figure out how these two departments work together as one. Now, IT still has a separate role of supporting the rest of the company, but as it relates to product development, they have to do a huge uh, percentage of the product development. And if IT is late, and a lot of people would say they're always late, you know, then the product's late. If, if, the, if the cloud part of that tennis racket uh, doesn't come together, we can't ship the tennis racket. There's nothing to ship. So uh, that's one challenge. A second challenge sort of related is this idea of data analytics and the need for a unified uh, data organization. Uh, sometimes you hear this new uh, title, chief data officer. And that's because if you think about that tennis racket spewing out data, and all of the tens of thousands of such tennis rackets spewing out data, encoded in those sensor readings, uh, again, the three-axis uh, accelerometer and the electronic gyroscope, encoded in that data is very important information for the customer, for the uh, engineering department, for the sales and marketing department, probably for the manufacturing department. If it's a more complicated uh, product than a tennis racket, then for sure there's information that would affect the service department. So not everybody can take that data into their own department and do their own analytics against it. Uh, some people have said that uh, data is the new oil, and then I say, okay, then analytics is the new refinery that converts a crude product into a valuable byproduct, but whose job is it to run that refinery? And uh, most companies haven't had such a refinery before, and now they do, and they're going to have to figure that out. There's a couple other kind of business model-related changes. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on customer success next. What software companies have found is that as you go to selling the product as a service, you know, software as a service, um, that you're now uh, providing a service that, quite frankly, is a lot easier to cancel because you don't have a sunk cost of capital. Um, for example, if I'm paying a uh, train for building comfort and I don't like the service, I might be able to just walk away from that contract and tell train, come and get your equipment out of here because I'm going with somebody else. On the other hand, if I bought all that equipment, there's no chance to walk away from it. I've got to make it work because I have a huge sunk cost. So the good news in this business model is that we have a tremendous amount of data. We know if that tennis racket's being used or not. Uh, we know if that air conditioning and the heating equipment is being used or not. We know how it's being used, when it's being used, loads and speeds and feeds it's subjected to, and so forth. So we ought to be able to analyze that data and be very proactive about the customer relationship. So this isn't really customer service because there's not necessarily a problem yet. I mean, the problem might be they're not using it. And when people don't use a product, they don't call the hotline to say, I'm not using the product. But if it's a product that's going to have a renewal point, you know, a product as a service that has a renewal point, and they're not using it, we better get in there and figure out why. It could be a customer satisfaction issue or a problem. 
might be a training issue. Let's get in there and contact this customer and, and say, how can we help you? You know, we used to use customers as sensors on our product. So we'd say, well, we ship the product to the customer, and if there's a problem, the customer will call us. They will act as the sensor to tell us what the problem is with our product. But now we're flipping it around and we're saying the product is actually a sensor for the customer. That tennis racket tells me how happy my customer is, simply you know, thinking of utilization as a proxy for customer satisfaction. So uh, that's a new organization that's part marketing, part sales, part service and support. And then DevOps uh, is also another learning from the software industry. So DevOps is a contraction of the word development and operations. And it turns out that the digital content of a product can be changed frequently. So as products become more and more digital, we're moving away from the notion that we have one shot at manufacturing this product. We might only have one shot at the physical part of the product, but we get many shots at improving the digital part of the product. Uh, you know, an example would be uh, Tesla improving the autopilot in their automobiles. Or it turns out even that tennis racket has a patch which has added new capability, new analytics uh, to what it's capable of uh, processing. So now the question is, how do you go about introducing new changes into products that are already out in the field and being used? You know, companies like Salesforce.com change the product daily uh, in small, careful, carefully tested ways. Because what you don't want to do is while adding a new feature to the tennis racket, introduce a bug that makes the tennis racket not even work as a smart connected product. That will cause, you know, uh, huge problems. Imagine if Tesla downloaded automatically a, a, a software update into your automobile and the next day your automobile didn't work and you, you know, you're late to work and everything else, you're going to be pretty frustrated. So DevOps is sort of a new organization that's part R&D and IT and really performing a manufacturing and a service and support function. And again, it's just not clear where to put this. So that's sort of what we're seeing here is that when you try to jam a physical and digital company together, you end up with a lot of things that just don't seem to fit in natural, obvious places. Now, there's a couple of uh, transitionary strategies we've observed. A lot of companies, and particularly larger companies that might be uh, conglomerates or multiple business units, are, are confronted with the problem that do we let each business unit do its own thing? try to recruit its own talent, build its own technology stack, uh, develop its own strategy for, for digital, or should we try to have some level of coordination across these business units? And the larger companies are opting generally for some level of coordination across these business units, and that's because this is an expensive proposition. Um, and, and plus, at the end, I'm not sure you want too many diverse uh, information architectures that you have to run. You have great uh, efficiency, of course, and some standardization. So a couple of ideas we've observed. One is uh, a cross-business unit steering committee. That's where the different business units all uh, contribute members who participate in a steering committee. And, and through that steering committee, they share uh, experiences and best practices and so forth. The problem, of course, with a steering committee is it doesn't have much bite. So somebody can go to the steering committee, uh, listen to what everybody else is doing, and then go back home and do something different. And a steering committee typically can't prevent that. Uh, if you take that to another level, you'll see uh, things like a center of excellence. So GE, of course, created GE Digital. And uh, GE Digital, I think, at some point will become a P&L, but today it's really a cost center. Uh, so there we've contributed talent and budget from all the operating units into a new operating unit that's a cost center. And this cost center is supposed to do more than just make recommendations. It's actually supposed to control uh, and centralize projects across the different uh, business units. And then you could take that even one step further, as Bosch did, and create a new business unit that has a P&L. It's actually an internal supplier to other business units and perhaps even to external entities. And, uh, you know, GE is, is headed to where Bosch uh, is, but Bosch did create this uh, full P&L. The problem, of course, with a full P&L is that uh, if I'm in a business unit and I'm looking at the internal supplier and I have to pay them for their uh, contribution, then I say, well, I should be able to look at external suppliers too because if, uh, if there's some external supplier calling on me and they have a proposition that's actually more interesting and perhaps even less money than the internal one, 
So no matter what you do, there are challenges, but definitely a, a, a good practice we've seen is to try to have some level of coordination uh, across business units. So just sort of closing out on my part here, uh, you know, what we've seen is that the changing nature of products uh, is completely changing companies. It's, uh, it's changing the way companies compete in the industry. Uh, it's changing the power structure and sometimes the definition of the industry. It's certainly changing the nature of work that the company does, what it means to create a product, what it means to sell a product, what it means to service a product, and then that in turn is putting a lot of pressure on the organizational structure of the company. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Steve and uh, we'll take some questions. Thanks, Steve. Okay, great job, Jim. Thanks very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, now we're going to go on to our audience Q&A. Uh, we've got a number of great questions and uh, we'll continue to take questions throughout this session. So please submit them uh, uh, as soon as you can. Also want to remind you that you can submit those questions by entering them into the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your webinar screen or use Twitter using the hashtag MITSMREvent. So um, first off, we've got an a interesting question here from Lindsay. Uh, you know, where do, where do most companies start? Yeah, I think... Uh let me say first, it's a very interesting CEO level topic uh, because most CEOs believe uh, at some level they're responsible for the strategy of the company and uh, you know what Professor Porter, who's a famous strategy expert and, uh, and I have shown is that this is really a strategic question that affects uh, your company in so many different and important ways. So typically, um, I, I think you need to start at sort of two levels. One is a bit of a strategy question about how might this affect our business? Um, how might it affect the nature of our products, the nature of competition, um, the work we do, the way we're organized? And then I think on the other hand, you have to play with the technology because uh, it's really only when you begin to experience this through some, through some uh, proof of concepts or pilot projects that you refine your understanding enough to actually meet in the middle and to say, I think we now understand how this technology works. Um, let's look at uh, how it would affect our strategy. So I see a lot of companies engaging strategy consultants, you know, McKinsey's, BCG's, uh, others like that, around how will this affect my business. And then at the other end, uh, engaging firms like ours to say, let me play with the technology, let me try some pilot projects, let me see what, you know, augmented reality is all about, let me learn about analytics, and so forth, so I can get smart enough to, to meet in the middle. Okay, super. Uh, something from uh, Benjamin here. Um, you know, are people using IoT for top line or bottom line savings uh, strategies? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question, Benjamin. Uh, you know, definitely it can have profound implications on both. Uh, if I start with the easy one, I can for sure tell you this will affect uh, bottom line. That the inefficiencies that can be taken out of the manufacturing process, out of the service process out of the sales and marketing process are profound. Um, you know, companies like GE have said they can make their manufacturing 10 to 20 percent more efficient. I mean, wow, if you look at, at how much money a company like GE spends on uh, manufacturing, that's, that's astonishing cost savings. But I think on the uh, revenue side, there is now a whole new vector to innovate and to differentiate to create new kinds of products. Like that tennis racket is, a, is an example of a hot product that, you know, is very differentiated from every conventional tennis racket that's out there. And then there's an opportunity to also sell uh, new kinds of services along with these new kinds of products. I don't for sure know uh, what Bob Alot is doing with respect to that tennis racket, but again, you could imagine, you know, a whole set of tennis management uh, types of services for, for clubs, for teams, for players. I'm kind of making that example up, but, you know, there are many such examples of services that might be uh, benchmarking. Like if I sell a very expensive capital asset to a customer, I might provide to that customer for a fee a service to compare their use of that very expensive capital asset to the anonymized list of customers I have who also use it. And, and again, they can say, am I getting enough value out of this expensive asset or is there something I'm doing wrong as compared to everybody else? Because I can anonymize that data perhaps and, uh, and, and sell it that way. So I think it has profound implications for both. There's also the implication of disruption. 
Um, and there are some interesting examples, you know, how, how Google Nest uh, sneaks up on uh, Honeywell and Johnson Controls uh, in the thermostat business, and they say, where did that come from? Or, uh, you know, how music went digital and, and left some people a little bit scrambling for a reaction and so forth. So, Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Kathy has a, an observation regarding the capability of that uh, blue pump video. Uh, she really says, uh, you know, is this a 21st century way of placing advanced CAD CAM in everyone's hands? Well, um, uh, yes, in a way. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a, a number of examples where, uh, let's say you have a machine that uh, has four or five different potential uh, fittings or configurations. Well, I can augment these four or five different configurations digitally onto the physical machine. Maybe you've seen examples too. Uh, um, IKEA, for example, will allow you to augment a piece of furniture in your living room to see if it's going to fit. And I think that Samsung will allow you to augment the television onto the wall to see if you want the small one, the medium, or the big one, you know, depending upon whether it'll fit. So rather than buy it, bring it home, say, oh, that's too big, too small, take it back to the store, you know, I just want an app. And, and it actually takes the design files and augments them, you know, into the physical setting. So b basically with augmented reality, you know, our view is you have a digital understanding of something or setting and you have a physical setting. And what we're really doing is mapping what we know from the digital world onto the digital setting and then projecting that onto the physical counterpart. Sometimes we use the word the digital twin to the physical item. But definitely it's, uh, it's an exciting new development in how we can use 3D and uh, even 2D forms of digital data ranging from CAD to photographs. Um, you know, to get to to get a whole new experience in how we interact with products. Okay, thanks. Uh, and Ara has um, uh, kind of agrees that um, you know, obviously, software and in industrial companies are uh, completely different. Um, but she asks, uh, do you think that industrial companies or manufacturers can learn anything from successful software companies? Are there key success factors from software companies such as IBM uh, that industrial companies can learn from? Yeah, I think that's uh, an absolutely great question, and, and I would recommend that every industrial company spend a little bit of time studying the software industry before they jump into it. Um, you know, I wouldn't jump into making tennis rackets without studying the tennis racket industry, and I'd recommend that, you know, companies not, not do the same on the other side because I think there have been a lot of mistakes made. Uh, one of the classic mistakes is the IT department says, I think we can do all this. We have smart people here, and I think we could build all that technology, and we'll be the first to market and so forth. And they uh, invest a lot of money only to find out that if you pick that stuff apart layer by layer, at each layer there's somebody who's much better than you are. Because one of the things the software industry does is it quickly specializes. Um, so maybe you're doing analytics only to find out that, you know, everybody else is now doing analytics better than you. Or, or maybe you've created some kind of a communications protocol and now you realize you're the only one who has that non-standard communications protocol. So I definitely think, uh, you can pick whatever example you want, but I definitely think it's a good idea for industrial companies to spend a little bit of time studying the software industry and then studying their industrial peers who are maybe a couple steps ahead of them in terms of... Uh, what success and challenges did they have trying to become not a digital company, but a hybrid company that's both at the same time? Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel uh, says that you talk about interacting with digital companies and their speed and agility, etc. cetera, but uh, IoT also has a physical component that needs to be um, prototyped and manufactured, tested, etc. before it can be evaluated. Uh, how do companies align these two tempos? Yeah, that's a that's a great question too. I mean, one of the things we've been working at uh, in my company is how to do agile in a cross-discipline sort of way, for example, um, because uh, you know we have to find a way that people can work together. And I think most people who have been exposed to agile in the software world think it's fundamentally a better better way of developing things than is the waterfall method. You know, the waterfall method. Just real quick. Probably we've all worked on projects where somebody gave us a list of requirements. We went off and worked on it for a long time. We said, okay, check, check, check. We meet all the requirements. We bring it, we show it to the customer, and they say, that's not what I meant. And, and then you get into the subjectivity of requirements and so forth. And, and, and the risk there is that huge amounts of effort and time are lost 
because you were executing against one definition of the requirements when the customer, looking at the very same list of requirements, had quite a different picture in their mind. So the notion of Agile is we need to show uh, continuous progress to the end customer or to somebody whose job it is to represent that end customer. Now, the challenge, of course, is prototypes. Because uh, on the digital side, I can make a prototype every five minutes. And there's no cost to doing so. It's easy. I can make another change and prototype that. Whereas on the physical side, you know, where there's, uh, where there's uh, you know, uh, machining equipment and capital equipment involved and so forth, it's a little harder. One of the reasons we're so excited, though, about uh, augmented virtual reality is if I could put the customer in a virtual or combination, uh, you know, AR, VR, mixed reality experience and actually show them in a very natural way what I'm talking about, you know, if I could put the couch in their living room and say, is this what you were thinking about? And it's the couch sitting in their living room as opposed to a picture of a digital couch or a couch on a computer screen. You know, I think we have some real new possibilities here to solve some of the obstacles that have limited the applicability of this great new agile scrum process, um, you know, have kept it out of uh, the physical products. I think we're making some progress. I know my company is certainly working on some capabilities uh, that would help companies implement a, a more agile scrum type of process across uh, software, electronic, and mechanical disciplines. Great. Thank you. Uh, question here from Tim. Uh, will the need for the agility of the organizations uh, move from being responsive on the order of hours and days to more real-time changes in microseconds and seconds? Uh, for instance, uh, one of the major issues in cybersecurity is that with the people themselves within an organization, and these systems may need to be able to be actively adapted to their changing behavior. Yeah, I, 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 I definitely think that um, the response time to what's happening at the customer site and, and then the connection between you and the customer certainly will, will get much faster. And, and I think the security issue actually has to go all the way up to real time. Like if there's a security problem, I can't learn about it, you know, weeks, months down the road. I, I have to know about it quickly so I can mitigate it. But even if we if we uh, set security aside for a minute, you know, there's no reason to let your customer get into a sour mood because they're not having success when, with your product when you actually had every reason to know they weren't having success with your product. You, you have every opportunity now to head it off at the pass. Um, I was with uh, Colin Engel from uh, iRobot yesterday, the, the CEO of iRobot, and he was talking about how their robots provide, you know, the, the Roomba-type vacuum cleaner robots and so forth. You know, they know what these robots are doing, the, the new generations that are connected. They know what they're doing all the time, and they know uh, uh, when the robot gets lost or when it fails to make it back to the recharging station or whatever. And, and it's just unacceptable for the engineers to ignore that data because they actually get the opportunity to see what's happening in the real world as opposed to like through focus groups or something like that that they, that they maybe formally had to do. So it's a, it's a very different experience. It really is all about the data at the end of the day and the powerful uses of that data to restructure the way you think about business. Interesting. Uh, Richard uh, notices when we talk about IoT, he hears a lot about banking and automotive industries. Um, what are your thoughts about how it uh, impacts healthcare? Yeah, I think uh, there was a very good uh, study done by McKinsey about two years ago that said uh, how much value will IoT create and uh, where will it create that value. And one of the things that was interesting is uh, it actually turns out only a very small minority is consumer related. So the first thing I want to say is that while most of us know about IoT because of our smartwatch or our Nest thermostat or something like that, it's actually a small single digit percentage of the value that will be created. So where will the value be created? Well, it will be created in business-to-business -business, uh, environments that may be industrial or it may be healthcare or whatever. But anytime we put things together in a location and we expect those things and the people and the systems to work together, like in healthcare, uh, there's a huge opportunity to generate value. Um, so whether it's factory automation, which uh, some companies, uh, some countries call Industry 4.0 or here in the U.S., we call it smart manufacturing. China calls it uh, made in China 2025. Uh, but that's an example of how things, automation equipments, work together in a factory or maybe in a refinery or switching gears a little bit in a hospital or a, or a healthcare setting 
or how do I get data from the patient who's out in their home back to the doctor who's uh, who's in the clinic or, or what have you. There are just a tremendous amount of business-to-business use cases whose value creation potential completely dwarfs anything that's going to happen in the consumer world. All right, thank you. Uh, Alexandra has a question. Uh, for, uh, for SMEs who are struggling to find their way through the meaning of IoT, uh, where do you suggest uh, they start their uh, thinking process? Um, well, the, the articles that Professor Porter and I wrote, I think, are a very good place. They, uh, they cover the technology at a high level, um, as I did here. Uh, they go a little deeper than this, but, but because it's hard to understand the business implications of a technology if you can't fathom the technology. But, but we quickly moved through trying to define what is the technology to saying um, how will it affect your company, both uh, externally and internally. And, uh, you know, in those papers, we use some of uh, Michael Porter's, you know, well-known proven frameworks, things like Porter's Five Forces to understand how it affects an industry. Uh, we used Porter's Value Chain Model to explore how it affects uh, inside your company. But we created a number of new frameworks, too, to help you, uh, you know, frameworks that are really specific to this uh, phenomenon to help you think about what would this mean to my company. So that's a place to start. Uh, you know, I think on the other end, you can uh, go download technology and play with it, uh, including ours, by the way, but others as well. And I highly recommend that you have a technical team investigating this stuff. And uh, if they say, I think we can develop it uh, ourselves, then I'd say back to the drawing board, that's the wrong answer. Uh, and you'll just have to trust me, it is the wrong answer because uh, it's biting off too much. But I think that there are many places to get both hands-on and uh, in sort of academic level uh, experiences and knowledge about this phenomenon. Incidentally, those two articles are available on our website, ptc.com, if you want to download them in uh, PDF format. All right, thanks. Uh, Rafe uh, was wondering, uh, what do you think the impact to leadership is in companies transforming to the digital? Yeah, that's a that's a very good and interesting question, Ray. Uh, I applaud you for it because uh, I think it is all about leadership. This is a difficult transformation, um, and I talked about some of the organizational reasons why. But there's big strategic questions. There are uh, opportunities galore. There are huge threats, and then there's a difficult uh, leadership problem with trying to change a company. And uh, I don't think there's ever been a company on in the, in the history of Earth that's changed itself dramatically without a strong leader at the helm. So I think it's all about leadership. And if, uh, if your CEO says, uh, yeah, I, I, there are other people working on that, there's a team or whatever, and I'm not involved, you know, I, I think you're going to have a problem, quite frankly. So, uh, you know, the fact that Jeff Emhel talks about this all day, all the time, is because he's trying to drive a great big company through a gut-wrenching transformation to be a digital company or a physical digital company. And uh, he knows how hard it's going to be. So he spends a lot of time internally working it and, uh, and a lot of time externally. And everywhere we look, you know, the, the companies who are leading the way are, are being led there by their leaders and none more so than the CEO. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Jay was wondering, uh, you know, so how do you transmit the data from the field to the cloud? Uh, are, is this using a GSM technology? Uh, whatever technology you want, there's a thousand ways to do it. I mean, uh, it could be uh, a wire. Uh, you plug your network into the into the physical product. That that doesn't work so well for a tennis racket. In the case of the tennis racket, I mentioned it's Bluetooth. Uh, a lot of times there's a cellular connection embedded in products that move around. Um, and in fact, all of the uh, telcos that provide cellular connectivity are all over this phenomenon because, to be frank, they've run out of people to sell data plans to, and now they want to sell data plans to uh, cars and trucks and you know, particularly things that move, and therefore you could never plug a, a wire into them. Um, but, you know, there's protocols, Zigbee, and, and protocols like that within homes and buildings and, and so forth. So there are many, many ways, and, you know, I'm not going to uh, begin to recommend which one because it's a lot of times very uh, context-sensitive. Uh, in fact, I will, I will comment on one. Uh, you know, Sigfox uh, in other forms of uh, low-bandwidth um, Connectivity. There's a technical word for this that's escaping me at the minute, but um, Sigfox can give you a device that uh, for a couple dollars a year, um, 144 times a day, will transmit a packet of data. And, uh, and, and you can do that for, you know, one, two, three dollars a year. So, for example, if you want to 
put sensors on cattle that are out on the range, um, you're going to have to figure out how those sensors are going to live for a long time without a battery recharge. And you don't need a lot of data to monitor the health and, and uh, you know, condition, let's say, of the cattle in the cattle herd. But um, a strategy like that is a great way, but you don't get a lot of real-time data. You know, you get it several times an hour, but you also don't get control. I can't send a command to it because I won't even get a chance to send a command until the next window of opportunity. But that's another interesting uh, example. I just offer that up to show you uh, quite a bit of variety in, in how the problem can be tackled and the right answer being highly dependent upon the uh, situation at hand. Okay, we've just got a few more minutes to try to squeeze in as many questions as we can. Uh, Raj was uh, was wondering if you could speak a little to the uh, value of the ROI of uh, digital initi initiatives and how they're accounted for. Yeah, I think every company gets to that point where they say, uh, okay, you know, we have an idea here and we have a champion. You know, is it worth doing? Because uh, it always costs money. And so then you have to ask the question, what is the return on that investment of uh, time, energy, money, headcount, et cetera? Um, Again, there's no one-size-fits-all answer here, but you know, normally we approach this from uh, how is it going to affect the bottom line, how is it going to affect the top line. Um, and that now depends upon your business model and the industry you're in and so forth. But um, I think it's very easy to show significant improvements um, to the bottom line in places like in manufacturing um, or any type of industrial infrastructure that could be run more efficiently. Um, I, I frequently say that service is the killer app for IoT, and the reason I say that is because the way that things in our world are serviced is uh, incredibly inefficient. Um, you know, if your oven stop, stops working a week before Thanksgiving, I mean, forget it. You're gonna you're gonna have to go out uh, because it's gonna take several service calls to figure out what oven you have and what's wrong with it, and then we're gonna have to go order parts, and then it takes a while for the parts to come in. And, and by the time you fix that oven, you, you actually realize I could have bought a new one for the same price and I actually wouldn't have missed uh, the Thanksgiving uh, dinner. So uh, service is a great place to look for operational efficiencies. I think, though, it's also interesting to look at the top line. How could we create new products, differentiated products, uh, new services? How could we increase our market share? I can't begin to provide any generic uh, commentary about that other than to say that there are substantial opportunities to do that, and, uh, and some companies have proven that, but I think for everybody, there's a huge opportunity to affect the bottom line. Okay, thanks. And just want to let our audience know that um, uh, a copy of the uh, presentation slides and a recording of this program will be available within the next uh, three to four business days, so look out for an email on that score. Uh, let's see if we can take one more question here. Um, uh, Bala wants to know, uh, how can industrial companies turn to digital industrial companies? Uh, well, what should be the, the first steps taken? Yeah, I think, uh, let, me, let me first say, Steve, before I answer that, I saw a couple of comments that people, some people didn't see the video. So maybe when you make the slides available, you could also make those two video clips available. But uh, coming back to the, uh, the question, uh, there are many forums. Uh, we just had a big forum here in Boston, but there's a regular supply of uh, forums where companies get together to discuss this. Uh, IoT World, or our event was called LiveWorks. There are, there are many such forums. If you go uh, Google IoT event, for example, you'll probably find a list of 100 of them. Um, so I'd recommend going there because you'll find other companies uh, there who are kindred spirits trying to figure this out. Uh, some people are presenting what they've done. A lot of people are there to ask questions of each other. Um, vendors, of course, can help. Uh, consultants can help. Uh, but definitely I recommend talking to other uh industry peers or not necessarily competitors, but people you could relate to and try to learn uh, what are they doing, why are they doing it, how is it going, what are the mistakes to avoid, what are the best practices to follow, etc. Um, so I think I, I point the, uh, point the uh, person who asked the question sort of in that direction as a good starting point. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that is going to be all the time we have for this session. Uh, it's been a great hour. Uh, I want to thank you for an excellent uh, presentation and Q&A. And again, a reminder, look out for that uh, 
a feedback survey that we'll also be sending to you via email. We greatly appreciate your feedback. Let us know how we're doing and how we can improve in the future. And that concludes this portion of our program. Uh, thank you again to our presenter, Jim Heppelman, President and CEO of PTC, and, of course, our sponsor, Teradata. And uh, we want to thank you all for your time, and have a great day. Thank you, Steve.